Good morning and welcome to the First Congregational Church of North Brookfield. We are so happy to have you all here and enjoying the hustle and the bustle of this morning's service. Please take a seat and then stand because we are about to worship up in here. <laughs> beyond this world to get peace in this world. Amen. I searched the world. It couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures of pain are never enough. Then you came along. Satisfied, hearing your love. 
shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious. introduction we have our announcements available on our newsletter in our newsletter our newsletters are found on our website or you can send an email to prayer at firstchurchnb.org and ask to receive the newsletters if you don't have internet you can call the church and leave a message on the voicemail and 
leave contact information and we can send you uh, a newsletter so that you're up on all of our announcements. Last Sunday we had our baptismal service. There were seven baptisms. If, if you missed it, you don't want to miss it. The next time we do it, it was really a, a wonderful, you know, beautiful experience. And, and I think it's probably like the only time during the week that there was no, uh, you know, downpour rain. So I almost changed the message this morning to something in Noah's Ark. It's, uh, we're getting tired of the rain. Um, but this now is a time where we take prayer requests. If, it's, if you have a prayer request that's private or that's not urgent, doesn't need to be shared with the, with the group, send an email to prayer at firstchurchnb.org and you can do that um, even right now. You can do that at night. You can do that whenever you think of it um, and it will be sent out to the right people to be praying. Um, but right now, prayers that are urgent that we should be praying for, I just have listed down to be praying for Haiti right now. There's an awful lot of turmoil going on there, and um, I'm sure that they can use our prayers. Uh, other prayer requests that we should be aware of this morning. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other? Anything else? Yes. Okay, let's pray and we'll conclude corporately by praying the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you that you are a God who hears our requests and wants to hear our requests. And so we pray now at the beginning of this service that your spirit would be present convicting, challenging, transforming us. And then, Lord, we just pray that uh, we would worship you well this morning. We pray, Lord, for Haiti and for all of the turmoil that they face. And we pray, Lord, for the young life and for summer camp right now that, that these uh, youth, that the youth would hear this word and respond to it and and, and be sold out for your kingdom moving forward through the rest of their lives. And we pray, Lord, for Kathy with this ear infection and uh, that has reached into her bone, and we pray for healing, for your healing hand to be upon her, as well as with Carrie having a kidney removed, that the recovery process would go smooth, and, Lord, that she would function well with this, with one kidney. And we just pray and ask that your healing hand would be upon her. We continue to pray for those in our congregation that are wrestling and dealing with illnesses and cancer and so many other different things. And we ask you, Lord, to be with them. We pray, Lord, for those that are grieving right now. And we especially pray for the Combs family with Arthur having gone on to glory this past week. We lift their family up to you. And, and Lord, we just thank you that we have a God that we can pray to. So hear our prayers. Hear those that are sent in on an email. Hear those that are just brought up to your throne uh, privately, quietly. And, and Lord, may we, be, um, may we be a people who follow you. And we just thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now we continue on in Judges, and, we, and we're asking the question, so now what do you do? I think we've all been there. You know, now, now what do I do? Uh, well, this is where we left off this last week as we've been going through Judges for those that may be new and just again to, to rewash over. The title of Judges is really, it really means a deliverer, a savior, a tribal leader, but a symbolic representation of all of Israel. And so the book of Judges is not about a judicial setting, but it is about deliverance and being saved from an oppressor. And we've been continuously saying, and we're seeing it, that, the, that there's a downward spiral throughout this book, that, that it doesn't get better, it gets worse. And with each increment that we go through, it seems to get worse. And, and there's this downward spiral. It, the book doesn't end well. If you're looking for a book that ends with this Yahoo, that was wonderful, we should read it again. This isn't that book, it doesn't end well. And we've been saying all along that God works in the context of the culture that he is addressing. And, and so when we see something that doesn't make sense to us, we have to put it in the context that what we're looking at in the book of Judges is a period of conquest, a period of, of war and, and fighting, a period of, of idol worship and, and terrible things, and, and the context of what's going on is very important. And God works in the context of culture. We'll see more of that, particularly today. And we've been continuing to say that faith is a story, that, that we cannot judge, well, judges judge, uh, I can't believe uh, 19 sermons and I haven't pulled that pun out yet. Um, we cannot judge a book by, the, by, by its cover. You know, this, this book of judges doesn't end well, but the question is, how does the whole story of God end? This is a book in the scriptures, but it's one of 66 books written over a period of 2,000, 3,000 years that, that present to us the story of God that is still continuing on. And, and we have to judge a story by its ending, not by one single act in the play. And so our faith is a story. And we've been saying that the book of Judges is a chiastic pattern, that there's a center to the book of Judges, and uh, there's foreign wars, domestic wars, foreign idols, domestic idols, and this cycle of Judges in the center, saying that this is the, being bolded and underlined. This is where our focus needs to be. And so we are now in the cycle of Judges, and what we've been saying is that the cycle of Judges itself is a chiastic pattern too. We see Othniel and his good wife. We will be seeing Samson and his bad wives. Ehud and the victory at the Jordan Fords. Next week we'll start with Jephthah and the civil war at the Jordan Fords. We looked at in the story of Deborah how Jael crushes someone's head with a ten peg and then today we will see someone else's head crushed. And then at the center was the story of Gideon. And we spent a lot of time in Gideon, and in fact, where we are now, the story of Abimelech is really an extension of the story of Gideon. Abimelech isn't really a judge. He's a self-appointed king. He's not appointed by God. He's a self-appointed king. His name means my father is king, and Gideon was his father. And, and so while Gideon said that he didn't want to be king, we saw that Gideon acted like a king, and that his son, uh, Abimelech, becomes king. And all of this takes place, when we looked last week, in this place called Shechem. 
And, and funny about Shechem is that it's not a new place. Abraham, when he enters into the promised land, when he first enters the promised land, here he is at this place called Shechem. It's located in the very center of all of Israel. And, and so Abraham comes into Shechem and God makes a covenant with Abraham and says, all of this I will give you. This will be your land for you and for your descendants, uh, that you will be like the, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, so shall your offspring be. And, and here at Shechem, God says, all this will be yours. And, and then we find that Moses writes about Shechem in the book of Deuteronomy. We saw that Moses detailed out that when they entered into this land, that they would set up a ceremony of blessings and curses, and that there were these two mountains, and, and the people were supposed to put the Ark of the Covenant in the middle, and they were supposed to be on one side and on the other, and one side was going to shout out a blessing. If we follow God, these things will happen. And then the other side of the mountain, they would say, if we don't follow God, these things will happen. And there's these blessings and curses, blessings and curses in this beautiful ceremony that takes place. So Moses defines all of that in Deuteronomy. And then we find that Joshua implements that. And, and, and so this area of maybe the size of Salem Cross Inn's property, you know, that's, that's there with a mountain on both sides. The people line up on both sides of, of this mountain, the mountain of blessing, the mount of curse, and they, they have this ceremony that's saying, this is what we're all about. We will not follow other gods. We will be Yahweh's. And of course, that doesn't happen. And then we see that Jotham, uh, one of Gideon's other sons, one of the 70 sons that were not executed because Abimelech executes all of Gideon's sons except for Jotham who gets away. And this is what we were looking at. This is all of chapter 9. And, and so we talked about how Abimelech gains his power, how he how he climbed up the, the, the ladder and, and he went to the people of Shechem and he started speaking to them, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better for you to have one king rather than all of Gideon's sons leading you? Wouldn't it be better to have one who, who is of your own blood from your own you know, place? And, 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 and so the people started to favor Abimelech and, and then uh, Abimelech, goes uh, with funds from the, from the Baal worship temple that they had set up there. He goes to Gideon's sons and he executes them all on one stone. We said last week how horrific that must have been, seeing 69 people brought one at a time to a stone and executed. And it seems as though to me that they were being executed on a stone altar. This is the context of what we're dealing with. And so Abimelech rises up to power. And then, and then we said that Jotham goes up to the mountain of blessing and he begins to scream out to the people of Shechem and to Abimelech this fable, this parable about how they went to the olive tree for leadership and the olive tree said I don't have time and and so they went to the fig tree for leadership and they said we don't have time we are enjoying the sweetness of life but we don't have time and, and then they went to the uh, grape vine and and the grapevine said not us we don't want to lead and so the parable seems to say that leadership didn't step up and, and what did come and rise to power was a thorn bush. And, and so Jotham equates Abimelech to a thorn bush. He says, rest under the shade of, of the thorn bush. And we talked about how crazy that would be for trees to rest under the shade of thorns. And, and how many of us, you know, bring a blanket out to a nice, you know, place on the lake and, and search for a thorn bush to climb under. 
And, and, but what we said, though, was that, that the rest of this parable talks about how the thorn bush would turn into fire and would consume the trees, and the trees would consume the thorn bush. And, and so the two would self-destruct with each other. And when we talked about the properties of the thorn bush, it wasn't, it wasn't used for anything except really as kindling to start fire. And so, and so what this fable was saying was that, that the thorn bush that you were going to make king is actually going to be kindling that starts a fire that consumes you and consumes the kindling. And, and so this prophetic message is given from Jotham, from this mountain, the mountain of blessing, and basically a curse is thrown down. And then we have the descent of Gideon's uh, power and all that takes place. And so previously, last week, we had a to be continued sign. And so previously, here's your recap of last week to catch you up before we enter into the to be continued section. Here's where we were. Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years and God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem and the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So he's in power for three years, a shorter time than any of the other judges, even though he's not an official judge appointed by God. Three years and all of this dissension, treacherous you know, behavior starts to take place between Abimelech and the people, the leaders of Shechem. That violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, on, uh, and on the men of Shechem who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. So, so God is, is telling us in this that, that after three years, he sends a spirit that causes division among the Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the reason for all of this is to bring justice for what they both did to Gideon's 69 sons, killing them all on the one rock. And so the next it says, and the leaders of Shechem put men in ambush against him on mountaintops, and they robbed all who passed by them along the way. And it was told to Abimelech. So for some reason, Abimelech is not in Shechem, and, uh, and, and so they decide to have this uh, uprising against him, and, and they set up, the leaders of Shechem set up these, this ambush, but it's not a private ambush, it's not a quiet ambush, it's, it's an ambush of tolls, you know, robbing anyone who passes by. And so Abimelech is told, and Gael, the son of Ebed, which means, Gael means the son of slave, and so Gael, son of slave, moved into Shechem. He's an opportunist. He sees, the, he sees the strife happening. He, he moves into Shechem with his relatives and the leaders of Shechem, and he puts com, put confidence in him, and they went out into the field and gathered the grapes from the vineyards and trod them and held a festival, and they went into the house of their God, and they ate and drank and reviled Abimelech. And so Gael, you know, causes this dissension. He's going to take on Abimelech. He's, you know, Abimelech isn't there. They... they press grapes, they, they make wine, they go into the temple of Baal, and they party it up. And, and, and they offer, you know, all of this. And, and the place where they're offering, we said, is, is Baal Bareth, which means Baal, the covenant. So the covenant with Baal. And so this place is Shechem, where covenants are made, where covenants are, 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 are talked about, where promises are made, here in the same place. The God of Baal, the God of covenants, is being honored. And Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who are we of Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jeroboam? That's the name for Gideon. And is not Zebul his officer? Uh, serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Uh, but why should we serve him? The 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 father of Hamor is another story which we can't get into right now, but you should take some time and look at that. Um, would that this people were under my hand, 
and I would remove Abimelech, and I would say, Abimelech, increase your army and come out. And so there's this boasting, you know, if, if I were in charge, I'd, I'd get rid of Abimelech. I, I, of course, Abimelech's not there. I'd get rid of Abimelech. I, I'd take him on. I, I'd even say, just increase your army and come out and fight me. And so this is the setup of what's going on. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, it seems as though he's like the mayor of, of this council. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled, and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his relatives have come to Shechem, and they're stirring up the city against you. Now therefore go by night, you and the people who are with you, and set an ambush in the field. Then in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may do to them as your hands finds you to do. So Abimelech gets word, and he begins to set up a plan. So Abimelech and all his men who were with him rose up by night and set an ambush against Shechem in four companies. And Gael the son of Ebed went out and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city, and Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from the ambush. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebul, look, people are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zebul said to him, you're mistaken, shadows of the mountains for men. And he buys it. And Gael spoke again later on and said, look, people are coming down from the center of the land. Actual Hebrew is the navel of the land. Um, the navel of the land and one company is coming from the direction of the diviner's oak then Zebul said to him where is your mouth now you who said who is Abimelech that we should serve him are not these people whom you despised go now out and fight with them and so the plan is, is brilliant. They have these different companies that are coming in. They set up an ambush. They wait for people to come out of the city gates, and they attack them. And then Abimelech's company, you're going to see, comes right around to the city gates and blocks anyone that's outside from coming in while they have other forces taking them out. And nobody from the city can come out because of where Abimelech is. And then all of them go into Shechem through the gate. And so the question is, now what are you going to do? The guy who you've been mouthing off to is here. His army is here. He's gathered even more people than before. Go out and fight. Well, now what are you going to do? And so here's where we left off, and here's where we start. And Gael went out at the head of the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him. And many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. And Abimelech lived at Aramah, and Zebel drove out Gael and his relatives so that they could not dwell at Shechem. On the following day, the people went out into the field, and Abimelech was told. He took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the field. And he looked, and he saw the people coming out of the city, so he rose up and killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city, while the two companies rushed upon all who were in the field, and they killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he captured the city and killed the people who were in it, and he raised the city and sowed it with salt. Now, when you see the word raised the city, it's not at all what it sounds like. When it says he raised the city, it means he leveled it. It's, it's like saying something is really bad when it's good. It's, it's, this is, when they say raise the city, he leveled the city. And, and here's the problem with Abimelech is that he's killing everyone. He's, he's in this rage of bitterness and anger, and, and he's so upset that he kills everyone everyone and then he sows the city with salt this is a, a ritualistic kind of thing to say a curse be on you 
And it's not just a ritual thing because it also, throwing it all out into the fields, makes the fields useless for a number of years so that no produce can be there. And so no community can survive where Shechem is for a number of seasons because of the salt sown into the fields. And so Abimelech not only kills the people, but if there was any stragglers anywhere, he's making the place desolate. What is it that drives him? What, where does his evil heart come from? I mean, it's, it's like he, he kills all of his brothers. He, he, he comes and, and when people are leading a revolt against them, he takes out every single one of them. And, and when all of the leaders of the Tower of Shechem heard it, they entered the stronghold. So some of the leaders that are responsible for all of this, they have a safe place in this tower. We saw before that a tower was torn down. When, when Gideon tore down a tower, we think of a tower as being something small, but wait till you see the size of their towers. When all the leaders of the Tower of Shechem heard of it, they entered the stronghold of the house of el Bareth, the God of Covenant. Abimelech was told that the leaders of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together, and Abimelech went to the Mount Zalman, and he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bundle of brushwood, thorns. He takes out with his axe, and he cuts down brushwood, and he took it, and he laid it upon his shoulder, and he said to the men who were with him, what you have seen me do, hurry and do as I have done. So every one of the people cut down the bundle, the thorns, and following Abimelech, they put it against the stronghold, and they set the stronghold on fire so that all the people in the Tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. Think about a tower. Think about how, you know, this capacity of this sanctuary is about half of that. We can fit 500 here if we, if we were shoulder to shoulder and we filled the balcony. Twice that number of people. This is the size of that tower. And Abimelech kills them all. This downward spiral, this why continues on, but it doesn't end there. Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes. This is a, a city, you know, it's estimated about 10 miles away uh, that perhaps was part of this insurrection. Went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city, another one of these towers. And all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in, and they went up onto the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire, just as he had just done. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. The end. A, a certain woman and a millstone. Now, when we think of millstones, we think of something like Hercules could only lift. It, but this is, this is referred to as an upper millstone. And so this is a stone that went in conjunction with the millstone, and it was typically two to three inches thick and about 15 to 18 inches in some form of diameter. And, and, and you would say, <laughs> what a shot. I mean, how do you, at a tower the size that we're thinking, how do, you, how do you nail somebody like that? Well, the odds are less because this person, this woman was smart enough, probably, I just envision it, picking up this stone and laying it on the sill of the tower precisely over the entrance. And she's waiting. And, and she's waiting. And there comes the one full of pride, the one who has to be the one that lights the match first, the one who has to have the claim of, of setting it all up. And, and, and so Abimelech comes up to this doorway, a doorway perhaps, you know, maybe wider, but a doorway and here she is with a millstone sitting on the ledge. And, and, and when we think about all of the stories of, 
uh, of judges. You know, we see, we see uh, Shamgar, one of the judges, and he takes out 600 men with a cattle prod. Strange weapon. And, and then we see uh, Ehud making a specially fashioned dagger that fits in his thigh. You know, a strange weapon. And then we see J.L. JL uh, using a tent peg as a weapon. And, and, and all of these just strange, like, out of the ordinary weaponry comes. And now we find a, a millstone. And later we'll see the jawbone of a donkey. So, so all of these different weapons, that's just an interesting point that, that God is using the simple to, to defeat the big, the, complica- the complex, the complicated. And so this millstone is pushed off at the moment Abimelech is about to set fire to the place and it hits him square in the head and cracks his skull. And somehow, somehow it's enough where, where like, the, he knows that it's a woman who pushed the stone off the ledge, whether it's people up on top beginning to chant and laugh, you know, that he's been killed by a woman because it was just a horrible, shameful thing to, to, to not die in battle, you know, and it was even more to, to, to die from the hands of a woman. And so for the second time in the book of Judges, we see God raising up a woman that takes out the villain. And, and so the next thing that happens... Um, then he called out quickly to the young men, his young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me. At least they say of me, a woman killed me. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. Trying to save himself of the embarrassment, but every reference that you find talking about how he died, it's a millstone to the head from a woman. Uh, he, he does not extinguish that. But it just shows you how even with a crushed skull, the arrogance and the pride that he has is, is not dissuade away from him in any way, shape, or form. He's all about his image and his legacy as bad as it is. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone went home. There's a leader bringing everybody to fight for a cause. They're all fighting because they're afraid of this guy. And they're all pretty glad that that he's dead. They went home. Everyone departed to his home. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam Gideon. This concludes the Gideon kind of section. You know, last week when we talked, and this, this morning when we started with the recap, there was, that, there was that one verse, did you get it? That one verse that kind of bothered me some. And, 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 the, the, and that one verse is encapsulated here. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years, and God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem, and the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come, and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who strengthened his hand to kill his brothers. So, so, so God sent an evil spirit to cause dissension between two evil groups, Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. God sends an evil spirit to bring about his judgment on them. And I just look at that and I think, we should just skip this. <laughs> But we can't. We have to look at the whole. Now, now, when we see the word evil in English, we have to look at what the word is in Hebrew. And in, in Hebrew, the word is ra. And, and it means evil. 
But it also is used to mean fierce. It's also used to mean ugly. It's also used to mean a number of other things. So when we look at that verse, does he send an evil spirit? And a lot of commentators would say, oh, there's an out. He didn't actually send an evil spirit. He sent a bad spirit. Uh, he sent a fierce spirit. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And, and, and these are difficult passages that we find in Scripture. But, but one thing that we can take from this and that we must take from this is that there is a spiritual realm. That we are not all there is in our dimension. That there is a spiritual realm. There are spiritual beings. There are angels. There are demons. There, there is a spiritual realm that is in concert with our realm. And that there is interaction that takes place between the two. And we see it throughout all of Scripture. So, so what do we make with God sending an evil spirit if we take the path that it was an evil spirit? Well, what do we do? Well, again, I've been saying along that the context of the culture is an important aspect that we have to consider. So in the context of the culture, all of the gods that they are worshiping fall under a reward-punishment model. If we do not sacrifice this to Baal, then Baal will curse us. There's this blessing and curse. Just as when they went into the land, there was the blessing and curses from the mountain. The culture was huge about blessings and curse, reward and punishment. And, and so in their eyes, to see that a God would send an evil spirit means nothing to them. It's ordinary language. In the culture, sending an evil spirit from God would be a normal thing because every God would do that. But there's differences when we look at things. There's, there's missing pieces that the writers did not have. And, and so when we look at the story of Job, and we don't have time to go into that, but if you read in Job, the beginning is that there's some kind of an... Of, of a, I don't want to say angelic because it's a spiritual realm. Well, a spiritual realm. There's the, that, that there's a council of spiritual entities that come before God in this conversation. And, and Satan is there in this conversation between God and Satan about what's taking place here on earth. And, and so there's other places in Scripture where there's these kind of councils. And, and so the story of Job gives us some insight into what this might be. But one thing that you don't see is the uniqueness of the God of Israel. The God of Israel also says, love your neighbor. You know, love God and love your neighbor. The, the other gods, this is a foreign thing, to the idea of loving a neighbor, or the idea of God's steadfast love. All throughout Scripture, we see this word hesed, this steadfast, certain, unfailing love of God for his people. And so we see a steadfast love with the God of Israel that you don't see with the gods of the land. We see the idea of a Savior, even the story of Judges, our Savior stories leading us to the need for a true Savior. We, we see the concept of eternal life with our God that, that doesn't seem to exist with most of these other gods. We, we see a context where our Father, where God is the Father figure that is foreign to all of these things. So, so there is a spiritual realm, the context of God sending a spirit is not out of the ordinary, but what is out of the ordinary is hesed love, a savior, love your neighbor, eternal life, a father relationship. And so the God of Israel is unique and different, and the good king. 
You know, the idea of following a good king is being built right here in Judges and will spell, spill out into the book of Kings, the first and second Kings and Chronicles and, and Samuel. We'll see the development of Kings all leading to the place of wanting an actual good king setting the stage for the incarnation and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. So again, when we talk about how to understand these verses, the context of the culture is important, but what we've also been saying is that the whole story is important. And so the New Testament reveals much more about the spiritual realm that, that wasn't available to the people of the time that Judges was written. And so we see that, that Satan is a roaring lion seeking to devour his prey. And we see that, that Satan enters into Judas. And, and so this uh, possession you know, seems to take place. And we see demon possession and people healed from demon possession. And we get more references in the New Testament to develop an ideology or a theology rather of demons. And, and so we see that Satan wants to sift Peter and he's very active in wanting to cause dissension, you know, among the disciples by sifting Peter. And we see the parable of the seeds and how Satan comes in and steals the different seeds that are there. And, and, that, and, and so we get to understand a lot more of the spiritual realm and the warfare that taken place and we see in the New Testament the cross and the defeat of all evil and the submission of all evil because at the name of Jesus every knee will bow every tongue will confess uh, every and so we see the cross as being the pinnacle part of understanding spiritual warfare so does God send evil spirits that's the question that we want to try to answer and it is not an easy answer it has a lot to do with with what's called providence and 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 providence is not just a place in rhode island but providence rhode island was named after the theological concept of providence god having a plan and being able to execute his plan no matter what and, and so we have this idea, this theology of providence and, and this theology of what's called sovereignty. And, and perhaps we should do a series when we finish Judges on these pinnacle theological components, sovereignty, the, the idea of providence, um, the, the idea of election and, and some of these things. We should look at that. Um, so I often tell this story. I've told it before here. But it's, this is my story to help explain all of this. And so the story goes that there's a woman who is hungry. She has no food. She is just very filled with poverty. She has a basement apartment and her window opens to the street level and she hasn't had anything to eat for days and she begins to pray dear God please I just need some bread you know it says in your word give us this day our daily bread I'm asking I need daily bread and and so she is praying earnestly praying out loud on her knees in her apartment and this group of kids are outside and they hear her praying and, and, and this group of kids, they, they, they start talking among themselves and kind of making fun of her, picking on God. She's praying to God for bread. And, 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 and then they come up with the idea. Wait a minute. Wouldn't it be fun? Why don't we, you know, put some pennies together and, and, and let's go down to the bakery and we'll buy a loaf of bread and we'll put it on the windowsill and she's going to think that God gave it to her. And they do. They buy bread and they, they put fresh bread on the windowsill and they come back and she's still on her knees praying, asking God for bread when the aroma of that bread, you know what it smells like, how attractive it is and, and how it just pulls you out of any kind of, you know, uh, distraction that you might have. And so she's praying and she begins to smell the bread and she opens her eyes and there on the windowsill is this fresh, still warm bread. 
And she begins to praise God for providing bread for her when all of a sudden the kids stick their face in the window and say, ha, 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 your old bag. You know, God didn't provide that bread for you. We did. And they're laughing and making fun of her. And she says, what you meant for evil, God orchestrated to answer my prayer. What you meant for evil, God used you to orchestrate my prayer. So if God sends an evil spirit, they wanted to go. He, he, he wasn't performing something out of line. He was just allowing the evil to be used for his good. And so when we see difficult passages like that, we need to understand that God's sovereignty and his providence prevail. And, and we really should look more at those topics to understand that more because it's beautiful. It, it, it is amazingly beautiful to understand that when we say God is in control, it truly means he is in control. So what do we take from this and how do we wrap this up? I think that if we were to examine closer all that's going on with Abimelech, with the men of Shechem, all that's going on with Gael, if we were to analyze and look at all of that and, and, and ask the question, is there an atmosphere that can be created that, that opens the door for the spirits of evil to be influential? Does that make sense? You know, right now, we have the conditions, the atmosphere for a thunderstorm, right? We know that it's eminent. We can see it. And, and, and so we're not going to change that, you know, but, but what we can do is try to understand how not to have an atmosphere for evil. How do we not have an atmosphere for evil? Well, looking at our story, Abimelech was full of pride. Pride is a prime component to the atmosphere for evil. Abimelech was angry that he was set aside. He was raised in Shechem while the other 70 brothers from the other mother were raised with Gideon, you know, in his Ophrah, in, in his town. The, the, the anger was there, the, the bitterness was there. And so we find that pride, anger, bitterness are all things that create an atmosphere for evil. Revenge. Abimelech was sold out on revenge. He couldn't stop. He, he, it, it, it just drove him. He, he could have stopped. He could have stopped before the tower. He could have stopped before going to the other village. He could have stopped. He could have stopped before he killed all of his brothers. It is just this revenge, you know, drove him. Choosing the path of curses will create an atmosphere of evil. Read through some of the section in Deuteronomy that we looked at last week. How are you doing on the things that if you do these things, there will be blessing, and if you do these things, there will be a curse? Because if you're taking the path of curses, you are opening the door, you're opening it up for an atmosphere of evil. Breaking covenants. Examine the covenants in your life. Are you being faithful to the covenants that you have made with God? to your spouse, to your family, to your friends? Are, are you breaking covenants? Because when you break covenants, you're opening up an atmosphere for evil. Self-destructive behavior. If you, if you see self-destructive behavior, you should be looking for it, the presence of a spirit that is causing 
division. And I honestly think, as we look at judges, and as we look at our world today, that the biggest problem that the judges had was that they had no commitment to Scripture. Had Gideon committed to Scripture, he, co he couldn't have done the things that he did. He couldn't have created the, the false idol. He, he couldn't have done all of the things that he had done. It, it's, it's a lack of an understanding and commitment to Scripture, and they had it available to them, and they didn't use it. And, and I would tell you today that the problems that we face, whether it's here or in our families, in our government, it's, it's a, a moving away from a commitment to this, to Scripture. It, it, if we were to begin to turn the tide back to having a commitment to Scripture, I think we would start to see the atmosphere of evil being repelled and, and, and being brought down. If we are going to choose to follow the wrong king, then we can't expect the right things to happen. Who's king? What king are you following? I want to follow the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And if we're not doing these things, then we're just like Gael being swamped by evil and someone just taunting and saying, so now what are you going to do? Maybe you're in that place now. Well, maybe you're in that place now where, where you've just gone to the wrong place. And, and, and this atmosphere of evil is real and it's going to continue to be real and it's going to get worse. Now what are you going to do? Two things, a commitment to Scripture. Uh, could we all up our commitment, wherever you are, up your commitment to Scripture, to letting God lead you, to knowing Him through His Word? And can we just put on the full armor of God? The, Paul's letter to the Ephesians tells us how to defend ourselves from an atmosphere of evil. And here's what he says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. They, they used to soak their shields in water. So, and they were made of leather, and so when a flaming arrow hit the shield and stuck in, it was extinguished. We, we need to soak, soak ourselves with this helmet of salvation, with the shield of faith. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. We need to choose the right king. Let's pray. Father, I, 
I ask you to make us alert and aware of the ways in which an atmosphere of evil can wreak havoc in our lives. And Lord, may we be committed to you as our king, committed to the scriptures, and committed to the armor that you have provided. And Lord, may we stand firm. Stand firm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
awesome. Uh, our closing hymn is 182. You can find it in the hymnals in the pews. <laughs> benediction this morning to take with us is just a condensed piece of Paul to the Ephesians. Hear God's word as we part. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you will be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Father, as we move forward out into the world, may we put on the full armor of God. May we decrease the atmosphere, eliminate the atmosphere of evil and usher in an atmosphere of worship and praise to you, your holy name. We pray, amen.